guys, it's Jody with Whiskey Rebellion Podcast. Man, I'm here with a special thing to do tonight uh, with my my good buddy, Little John. But uh, before we get started, hey, what's in your glass? John, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me, and um, I- I'm really excited about this uh, kind of special edition show, um, you know, where we get to talk a little bit about uh, Tennessee whiskey. Um, you know, we're going to take a look back in history a little bit tonight. Um, but we all, um, we're also going to kind of explore what, um, what's on the horizon for Tennessee whiskey and, uh, you know, what that means and kind of the new merging market. So i um, really excited. We got some special guests coming on online here soon. So, um, so I'm excited about the conversation tonight. Cool. Cool. You know, uh, while we sit here for a moment and we ponder our, our guests coming on and things of that nature, what has been, I mean, I can tell you, Anybody's watched the show know my thoughts on Tennessee whiskey. So um, what, what has been your experience? I mean, I know that you're military like myself, spent a lot of time here and there, and uh, we have our specific favorites and we know what got us on to probably drinking bourbon, this, that, and whatever. But what's, when you think of Tennessee whiskey, what do you think of? Yeah, I, I think um, just like most people, I, I think when, you know, you hear the term Tennessee whiskey, you go to those, um, those staples that, you know, um, our, our fathers, our grandfathers, you know, um, their great grandfathers, you know, even talked about, you know, the Jack Daniels, the George, George stick, George Dickles. Sorry. I can't even talk tonight. (laughs) Uh, haven't even had a drink and I I can't even speak. Um, but I, I think, you know, our minds go to those, you know, staples that have always been, um, in Tennessee, um, you know, based on our former laws that we have before, you know, we're, um, before we had these new distilleries, you know, popping up, you know, as early as, you know, uh, 2014, 20, you know, early 2010s, um, you know, com- uh, coming into the Nashville market and, and other areas of Tennessee. But um, that's what I think of. Um, and I think that's, that would, I think we can confidently say that's what others, you know, think of as well. That's cool. Uh, so this would be a good place to bring in our next guest. All right, so we have Sarah Beth Urban. She is uh, closely tied to Keith Urban. Uh, she's going to be on here. She's from the the Tennessee Whiskey Trail. She's the executive director, if I remember correctly, from our previous conversation. Yes. And uh, but I'm going to leave kind of the conversation between you and John. I'm going to be here just to ask a few as well. But can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in the in the the Tennessee whiskey world? I mean, as we introduce the show, there's essentially most people think there's just Jack Daniels and George Dickel. So. Tell us a little bit about that. That would be false. Um, But I would also forgive you for not knowing necessarily because most of our distilleries in Tennessee are fairly new. Um, We only had the laws changed that allowed distilling outside of three counties in 2009. So the majority of our distilleries date from post-2009. So when people say they're not too familiar with the Tennessee whiskey world, I understand because we're, we're young, but we're growing at a rapid pace. So um, right now, I think we have about 33 members in the state and are growing every day. I get new applications in every day to join our guild, which is our trade organization, and obviously the trail itself, which is kind of our public-facing tourism component. So does the trail go from, I mean, explain the trail to me. I mean, like when, when I think of the trail, for example, in Kentucky, I can tell you every, every distillery it's on there and, yes. and where they're all located, uh, co-located essentially on the Blue Ridge Parkway. So when you look at it uh, from the, the aspect of Tennessee, yeah, I can point to like where, you know, you know, where Jack Dale is located, where George Dickel is. And what's the other one that's down that way as well, going towards Pulaski? Um, uh, Richards. Yeah. And, Richards. Uh, in 10 South. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So are, are there like, where are, the, where are the majority of these distilleries located? Is there a lot of them located like in East Tennessee or West Tennessee? Like where are they, where are you seeing the growth at? So um, I always say we range from Memphis to Bristol, um, but in West Tennessee, it, it is a little slim at the moment. Um, right now on the trail itself, we only have one old Dominic in Memphis, although um, Blue Note is a guild member. Um, a lot of them, though, um, reside in that middle Tennessee area, right around the Nashville area. We've got some in Clarksville, lots in Nashville, some in the Franklin area. And then you've got that kind of south central Tennessee where like Jack Dickel and Pritchards are. Um, and then you have a ton, we have a ton in the Smoky Mountains area. Um, so that's, and that's where kind of our moonshine or that background history of that, you know, Appalachian culture kind of comes in. There's a ton of moonshiners out there. Um, and then we've also got Knoxville um, and Chattanooga as well. So it's, it's all over the map. There's a few central locations where if you go there, you can hit a couple stops along the way. 
Um, but I just, I love the part, I love the fact that we take place across all three grand divisions of Tennessee. Nice. So, so Sarah Beth, um, you know, I mean, I, I think it's an awesome opportunity, like, you know, the position that you hold and being able to, you know, be the executive director of a, a new trail and, and something that's, you know, becoming a, a, a awesome tourism spot for Tennessee, bringing in a lot of revenue for, for the state and different communities. I mean, h- how did you find this opportunity? I mean, what, because I, I think, you know, based on your LinkedIn profile, I mean, you, you came from the state, I think you were in the hospitality, you know, tourism, you know, um, area before, but I mean, how did you, you know, make your way to the whiskey world? I, I would tell people, I'm, I feel like I'm living proof of you never know where you'll end up. <laughs> um, because my my undergrad degree is in history and my master's is actually in public history with an, with an emphasis in museum management. So I actually started as the executive director of a small historic house museum um, in Hendersonville, just outside of Nashville. So mm. that was my first gig. Um, and it was really more, you know, I mean, I love the history aspect of it and I, I really enjoyed that. But when you're in the executive role, it's more of the management organization, dealing with the board of directors, all the stuff that goes in behind the scenes. Um, and so then I moved over to Tennessee tourism and kind of continued in that role, but I worked in all 40 counties in middle Tennessee, kind of doing marketing and promotion for them. Um, and then also a lot of connections and um, managerial duties. Um, and that's actually how I met the Tennessee Whiskey Trail guys. I was with Tennessee tourism when they started the trail. I was actually at the launch um, in Franklin and loved the idea and the concept and I saw so much potential there. So when they started looking for an executive director, I reached out and was like, absolutely, I'm your girl, sign me up, I'm ready to go. That, that's awesome. Um, so you're, you're talking about you're getting in applications, you know, almost every day of new distilleries popping up. Um, you know, sometimes it's, that's hard to keep up, you know, you know, I, th- I think looking back at, you know, the whiskey market, if you, if, you know, if you, if you take a look back, you know, 10 years ago and you, you know, go to the Tennessee whiskey section in your local liquor store, I mean, it was Jack Daniels, it was, you know, Dickel, it was, it took up two shelves. Um, and now, you know, that area has expanded. Sometimes it's like, shoot, where is this at? And you got to pick up the bottle and like, oh, well, that's two miles down the road. Um, you know, so how are how are you guys choosing to add folks, you know, new distilleries to the to the trail or even the guild? What's that process yeah, so, look like? Yeah. So as a trade organization, um, it's mainly just about having a DSP license and then being a, a, willing to abide by a code of conduct that we have in place just to kind of, you know, keep our standards high, make sure that you're adding value to the state of Tennessee and to our organization. Um, and then obviously for the trail, we have some stricter standards that um, are about marketing pieces, you know, you're being open for tours, um, having a good, you know, a good facility that people can come and visit. So we have a couple of different parameters that we ask people to meet before they join. But um, by and large, especially for the Guild, it's really about that networking and connections. We want people um, to feel welcome. We want them to understand that they can reach out to anyone along the route. So, I mean, if you're, you know, reaching out to someone who's brand new or you're reaching out to the master distiller at Jack Daniels, they're going to take your call and answer your questions because, you know, you're a Guild member and it's, it's part of the process. Um, and then the other cool thing about being in the guild is actually because I was there today, um, you get to have your products placed in our new airport restaurants. So mm-hmm. we just opened three casks at the, la- the last day of 2021, so December 31st, um, and it's in the airport at the Southwest Terminal in Nashville at BNA, and it is amazing. The food is so good. They only serve Tennessee spirits across the board, um, and then they only serve Tennessee beer. So, and then all of the food they're making locally in-house, they smoke their own turkey, they, you know, make the mac and cheese and bake the bread there in the morning. So it's a phenomenal experience. And as a guild member, you get the ability to have your products in there. So what I heard just then was a subliminal, um, I guess, you know, shout out to Southwest because it's in that hub and and we all need to be heading that direction so we can have these Tennessee, uh, the Tennessee experience, it sounds like. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So super excited about that. they're out of Nashville and you need a drink, uh, uh, three casks is the name of it. So that's your place to go. And they also have a bottle shop. They do. And it's not operational. Yet. They're working on it. So they have to have these like special resealable bags so that, you know, people can take away with them and they don't have it quite yet, but they're working on it. Yes. There will be a full blown to go bottle shop there. Yeah. So when Heath comes on, we, we're actually going to kind of dive into, um, you know, that restaurant venture. Um, I was actually at, um, you know, H Clark distillery um, right after Christmas. Cause um, I have, 
you know, I, I live in Fairview and so I'm right down the road and I still haven't been there yet. And so I was like, oh, you know, come, you know, he's joining company. I was like, I need to get out there before, you know, maybe things change a little bit. And so I got to do the tour, but, you know, Heath was out there. He was actually proofing some, um, a, a batch that needed to go out, um, and so he was kind of telling us a cool story about, you know, the moonshine still that they were um, able mm -hmm. to put in there. And um, so it, th th we're hoping that Heath will kind of tell that story a little bit later on. So but it's a super exciting. And I, I think it's um, uh, just exciting to kind of see the growth. But uh, can you speak to a little bit of the growth? I know we got, only got a, a few more minutes left, but, um, you know, you came on board as soon as the trail opened up and as soon as the guild um, was formed. You know, can you speak to a little bit about the growth, like from your first year of how many distilleries we had here in Tennessee to kind of where we're at now and what we're maybe projecting over the next, you know, 18 months? Yeah, ab absolutely. So I actually wasn't with the Guild when they started. So they started in 2015 and then the trail launched in 2017 and I came on in 2019. So even my position is part of that growth because they got to the point where they were able to afford having an executive director and a lobbyist and a trail manager. So um, seeing the staff expand has been a huge part of our growth. We actually even just added a marketing director for the trail this year. So slowly expanding there. When they first formed in 2015, I believe it was maybe like nine to 10 distilleries that got together and were like, hey, we should, we should do this. Um, and then from there, you know, obviously one of the biggest pieces of that was legislatively, because there's still so many laws that are, you know, to a degree prohibition era in Tennessee surrounding whiskey. I mean, when I start explaining some of the laws that regulate whiskey, people look at me like I have a third eye because it's just insane. Um, but it's so just seeing that growth from what 10 founding members to 33 today, wow. launching the trail, I think they had about, you know, maybe close to 20 in 2017. And now we're at 28 with applications coming in every day. So it's, it's an exciting time to be in this industry. And it's really cool to see the different products that come on board and the different locations that people pick. I mean, you've, you know, we've got Brushy Mountain, which is at the old state penitentiary um, in wow. Petros, Tennessee. Um, and then I have an application for a new guild member that's located in an old dam outside of Chattanooga. So people are finding cool new ways to make a distillery and open one. And it's, it's fun to, to kind of be a part of that for sure. That is cool. That's awesome. Cool. Well, um, last question, Jody, that I have is, um, Sir Beth, can you tell us, you know, what can, you know, whiskey and bourbon drinkers expect, you know, from the Tennessee Trail you know, in the next five years, where do you think we're headed and what, what do you, you know, what are some new and exciting things that, you know, we may be able to expect? I think you're going to see, um, like continuing to see this growth, continuing to see a lot of new distilleries and a lot of exploration with those products. I think that's one thing that's very different between Tennessee and Kentucky right now in Kentucky, lots of established brands that have these products that you know what to expect when you get there. And in Tennessee, we're still experimenting with what our brands are and how those are made. And when you go to our distilleries, you can still have a conversation with the founder this versus in Kentucky where there are you know, stories from generations ago about how these places, you know, people don't even know if they're true. In Tennessee, we're still making up our fake stories about how we were. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> But you'll be seeing a lot more of that experiment, a lot more of these new things that come down the pike, you know, from, and a lot more variety in Tennessee. So obviously there's Tennessee whiskey. We've, it's a protected definition product. We have International Tennessee Whiskey Day. Um, but we also have places like Corsair that make this amazing triple smoke here in Nashville. Um, Company, which is our one of our newest distilleries that's opening with Jeff Barnett, is um, They've got, you know, that that they've gone with the more traditional route, but they also have Heath Clark's gin um, in their lineup, and that's one of the best gins I've ever tasted in the world. Um, so it's you're gonna get more variety here. You're gonna see, you know, the continued. Yeah, there it is. You're gonna see the continued growth of of the moonshine products. I mean, you walk into some of those stores, I can't even believe what they've done with tastings on that end. Um, but just continuing to see us thrive because it's we're here to stay for sure, and we're gonna make our our presence known. Well, I truly appreciate uh, that you taking the time today, Sarah Beth, to uh, to to be part of this, and uh, you know, we get an opportunity to uh, to I guess exploit. Um, this, this really awesome thing that I honestly had no idea was even here. And I'm a big time bourbon enthusiast, you know, so much so that I have a show about it, you know, and I had no Absolutely. idea what's in here. <laughs> so thank you so very much. And it was so very kind uh, having you on the show. And uh, 
hope that we get to have some more conversations so we can build that relationship. Uh, apparently I, I found out earlier today, all it takes is a phone call. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, thank you so very much and uh, hope Thanks to talk to you. Me. Yes, ma'am. Thanks there, Beth. Thanks Jonathan. All right. All right. Well, welcome back everybody. We are um, privileged to have um, Mayor Bill Keatron. Um, he was the um, was a former state senator for the state of Tennessee and one was, was really one of the lead pioneers in helping us get to the state of Tennessee to kind of where we're at right now and being able to reap the benefits of, um, you know, having, um, you know, new distilleries and, and new types of whiskeys and branching out past, you know, kind of those household staples of George Dickel and, and, and Jack Daniels and uh, creating new household names. Um, so we're, we're blessed to have you. Uh, but uh, Mayor Keach, just to kind of kick us off, you know, give us a little bit about your background, what, you know, got you into politics and, and what really was kind of your motivating factor to kind of help lead the change for the state to change the whiskey laws. Well, uh, I actually um, ran for the position I'm in now. Back in 1990, I ran for county mayor. It was called county executive back then. I ran and I got defeated uh, my first time out, but uh, that didn't get Look at you taking a shot. Uh, <laughs> that didn't discourage me. I came back immediately after that loss and ran for the county commission in 1990, where uh, I got elected and I stayed representing the Blackman community because um, that's where I live off of behind the battlefield. And uh, so I got elected, stayed eight years. And then I turned around and ran for the state Senate where I served 16 years and served in leadership. And, and um, so I was uh, first approached on alcohol. You know, our alcohol um, laws were very archaic. They had not been changed since prohibition. Um, and so we were kind of a going back to the blue laws we were kind of a, a dry dry state if you will compared to other states and so many people were beginning to move here and one of the things that they were asking for was wine and grocery stores so i introduced that bill um, i jumped in because i saw it as an opportunity to give people what they were actually wanting it made didn't make sense to me that you could go into a restaurant all, even on sunday and uncork a bottle of wine and then take the rest of it home with you, but then you couldn't sell it. The retail guys couldn't sell it um, in the liquor stores. So we went through all that whole process. It took me seven years to finally pass wine and grocery stores. And then I came back and passed wine sales on Sunday and allowed the liquor stores to be open on Sunday. So um, uh, one thing led to another and and that was a big battle. And those guys didn't, didn't like me at all, the retailers, because they thought I was going to take revenue away from them. But I actually, I made them, um, their stores, a convenience store on steroids. You know, they could sell potato chips, uh, corkscrews, T-shirts, and beer. They could sell anything they want to in, in retail liquor stores. So we started unraveling all those prohibition laws. Well, one, uh, when the General Assembly... Uh, usually go, goes back into session. Every uh, group usually has um, uh, receptions at night, okay? So got an invitation to go to the architect and engineers for the state of Tennessee, and they were having their reception at the Parthenon uh, over at uh, Centennial Park. So I was standing there drinking some wine, and, and uh, uh, this gentleman comes up to me, and he looked familiar, but but uh, didn't know exactly who he was, he introduced himself to me. His name was Derek Bell. Derek Bell owns Corsair. Well, at the time, Derek did not have Corsair down on 12th Avenue. He was actually making vodka up in Bowling Green on the square. He'd gone into an old building and he said, Senator Ketron, he said, I want to come back home. You know, his dad owned Bell Construction Company. He said, I want to come back here. He said, I drive to Bowling Green, you know, two, three times a week. And he said, I want to come back to Tennessee. So at that time, we only had um, Jack Daniels, George Dickel, and George Dickel had actually closed down for a period of time. And then we had Pritchard's. Pritchard's, for some reason, had uh, the availability under code going back to prohibition, the avail availability to get a, a distiller's license. But at that time, we only had three. And he said, uh, can you help me? I said, I'll be happy to introduce the bill. So 
It's kind of like small craft batch whiskey. We crafted a bill that would allow um, small craft distillers to open up. And I sold it to the General Assembly that it was a, uh, an economic development bill. It was a agriculture bill because they would all the uh, they would help the farmers by buying their grains here locally. It was a tourism bill. It was a revenue bill for the department. Um, it was a an employment bill because all these distillers have anywhere from four to twelve people working, and um, so when I passed it, it uh, I was kind of stupid. I should have gotten out of the Senate and gone to Gatlinburg like the three guys that opened up, uh, you know, the uh, old Smokey. I think they made like 20 million the first uh, the first year that they were open selling moonshine <laughs> downtown Gatlinburg. Uh, but I think then I came back right after that and, and uh, went to the Department of, of uh, Tourism and Department of, of um, uh, ECD and asked them for money to create a whiskey trail. Uh, similar to the bourbon trail that is up in, in Kentucky. So I remember when we, we had a celebration and kicked off the whiskey trail, it was over at the, f- the factory in Franklin. And um, they said, Senator Ketron, come up and you're, we wouldn't be in business if it weren't for you. Come up and tell us why you did this. And I said, well, you know, our history, we need to be telling our history. And, and now that we're having all these micro distillers pop up, and give economic opportunities for the free market to, to survive from Chattanooga to Memphis to Nashville to Tri-Cities to Gatlinburg. People can drive from each distillery, just like this one here at Short Mountain over in Woodbury, who needs the revenue. So, uh, so I, I said that. I said, but we need to be telling our story. And I said, unlike the Bourbon Trail up in Kentucky, you know, if you go online, which I did, I went online and looked through their, their uh, history of the bourbon trail whoever put their history on their website for the state of kentucky didn't do very well because i said that the that the settlers came into the eastern mountains of kentucky and they brought the recipes from scotland and ireland with them you know their forefathers and started making bourbon uh and then they put them in cask and and they took them by by horse wagon all the way down to new orleans where they shipped it out and during that period of time, you know, the, the whiskey came out white, but by the time it was on those oak barrels, it had taken on the color. And I said, but I, I said, Kentucky's history sucks compared <laughs> to Tennessee's. And there happened to be a reporter from Kentucky there. And the next thing I know, I'm getting a call from the governor, which I knew of Kentucky. And you want to know why I was disking the state you know, about, uh, about their history. And I said, well, you need to get somebody to make it better. I said, but our history is better in Tennessee because we had those same Irish, Scottish Irish uh, folks who came and settled in the East Tennessee mountains. They brought their, their recipes with them from Scotland and Ireland. And I'm sure they brought with them violins, musical instruments as they were sitting around the campfire making their whiskey uh, from where they came from probably somewhere along the line, the violin had five strings and a string broke and they turned it into a four string, which became the fiddle, okay? And so out of that fiddle came country music, right? Country music started in Bristol. There's a country music museum is in Bristol, Tennessee. So if you fast forward from all of that with country music and whiskey, fast forward to about the forties and fifties, they were still making moonshine in the mountains of Tennessee. So up near Piney Flats, right outside of Bristol, is now Bristol Speedway. But back in the early, late 40s, early 50s, the guys who were transporting that, that moonshine whiskey started souping up their cars uh, so they could outrun the law enforcement officials. But on Sunday was their day off but they wanted, they were, had bragging rights who had the fastest car. And they started meeting on a dirt track in Bristol. And out of that became NASCAR. So if you take, you know, country music, whiskey from Tennessee and NASCAR, you can't beat that history. <laughs> well, I, th- I think uh, Tennesseans, we, we love our history and we, I th- you're right. We do it. We do it well. Um, 
you know, because some, you know, some of our viewers and, and, and those who are part of our, our Whiskey Rebellion Barcast um, are, are not from the state of Tennessee, you know, you know the laws, um, you know, prevented us from opening up distilleries outside of coffee, more and um, Lincoln. Lincoln County. Thank you. Um, but w- what about the laws that ju- you kept, you know, the distilleries from popping up? W- what about the laws that just prevented that for us? Well, those laws were put put in there in prohibition back at the turn of the century. Prior to that, everybody, you know, little taverns, even in Nashville, served their own whiskey, kind of like everybody in Germany served their own beer, you know, but prohibition shut it down. And, and so those are the only three left of those three counties in kind of the south central area of, of Tennessee. So it, it took me going in and, and rewriting with the help of Derek Bell um, and recrafting. And he had a lot of friends who wanted to do the same thing. They wanted to make, uh, you know, triple filtered vodka or, you know, like this one from a uh, small batch rye whiskey or short mountain, Billy up there at short mountain. You know, there's so many that have popped up. And, and so now, we're, we're kind of a shining star um, and made it legal. And, and you know, we had people come out and, and protest. They had people came in and testified when I was trying to pass the bill that, that uh, but, you know, mothers against drunk drivers never did come out and protest that, you mm-hmm. know, controlled. Um, you know, people are going to drink, they're going to drink. If they're going to overindulge, they're going to overindulge. But why use that? It, it, same philosophy of prohibition to keep uh, small businesses from the opportunity of being an entrepreneur, you know, free market, let the free market survive and, and act on its own. So I think we got a lot to be proud of in Tennessee now. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely agree. Um, and I'm still trying to convince Jody here to try Jack Daniels again. He's, he's not a big fan. Yeah. Uh <laughs> But, um, you know, but, but what, what we rely on China and everybody in China <laughs> loves Jack Daniels. That, 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 that is, that is true. Word is Jack Daniels. <laughs> no, it's definitely the most famous uh, bourbon whiskey from around the world. I agree with you there. I just yeah. know that I loathe it with every inch of my soul. Um, <laughs> it is what it is. I don't mean anything derogatory towards, well, I do. That's not, that's not entirely true, but I do like some of the other things that like Leaper's Fork is fantastic. And that can, I can contribute to all that success of Leaper's Fork to the start of that deal. So I can absolutely say thank you for that. And then Bell Mead's awesome. Um, and then we'll Bell good. Yeah, yep. Blue Notes, one of my favorites. Um, so there's some great Tennessee whiskey, whiskey here, but I was thinking when you were talking about the fiddle story. Uh, uh-huh. I, I think I could be wrong, but isn't Fiddler from Tennessee as well? Um, I, I'm, I wish I had one of the bottles. It may be actually from uh, from Atlanta, and I may have just in, inappropriately name dropped them. But um, but Fiddler whiskey, I, I, for whatever reason, when you were talking about that story, I was like, ah, that makes sense. I wonder if that's how they got their name. And if not, yeah. they need that. They need to get that puffery they, online on board. Yeah, you know? I would have done that history real quick. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Uh, Mayor, I appreciate you being on the show today. Uh, like we said, we, we, uh, we got you within the time frame. Uh, thank you for taking the time to give us that, that brief history lesson. And by the way, based on the story you just told uh, about our history here in Tennessee, <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's better than Kentucky's uh, bourbon trails. I mean, I was, I, I was, I completely could see it in my head, visualize it. I could, had totally, I, I could name off everyone that was there. And then all of a sudden I could see the string break on the, on the violin that became the fiddle. And then we got the country music that happened in Bristol. And then we're now we're racing uh, NASCAR on Sunday. I'm like, dude, he connected all the dots that I've always wondered about. <laughs> sir. <laughs> well, well uh, Mayor Keatron, one last question for you before we wrap up. Um, so w- what is your go-to um, Tennessee whiskey? What, what are you enjoying now um, with everything that's out there? What, what's kind of, one that stands out to you as, you know, being one that you love to have a sip of? Well, uh, I, I do like uh, Derek's. Uh, he, he's got a, a, a smoke whiskey that he makes down there at Corsair. Um, I like the guys down there behind him. Um, you know, the, the cool thing is is uh, it down there where it, he's uh, Tennessee 
pickers are located on 12th Avenue and, and mm-hmm. course area Delray. If you go back and take the tour and, and uh, you see the, the, the brass um, uh, kettles back there, they've got a, the, on a plaque on that kettle and it was what is put on uh, Popcorn Sutton's epitaph on his, on his headstone, his wife put on there. And it says, um, F you, uh, F you, something. I can't remember what it was, but that's what, you know, he was telling the federal, <laughs> federal government because they don't him in jail one more time. And they put that on, on that steel down there. And it, uh, so it's, it, it's really kind of cool. Um, I, I do like, uh, no offense, but I, I, I kind of like drink a little, uh, Jack Daniels honey on, on, on the rocks. It's kind of mm. nice sip around the pool. That's no yeah. offense. I mean, everybody has their faults. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's my weak one. Right? <laughs> but either way, I do appreciate again you being on here today. Thank you so very much for taking the time out of your day to uh, to to yes, enlighten us. And uh, with that being said, have a wonderful afternoon, sir. Y'all have a good weekend. You too. All right. See ya. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. What's your name? What? What is your name? Tony!